This week on The Complete Rider. Nearly 117 years after they developed the Appaloosa, we learn of the Nez Perce's next new breed. And he was 27 years old and was the oldest living Kentucky Derby winner. That and equine health on This Week. When we think of the Appaloosa horse, we must remember the strong connection between this ancient spotted breed and the Native American tribe known as the Nez Perce. Selective breeding was second nature to the tribal people. They developed a tough, swift, sure-footed mount to meet their needs of the time, but that was over 117 years ago. Since then, times have changed for the Nez Perce people, and so has their relationship with the Appaloosa horse. They have always been known as tremendous breeders, and today, that historical knowledge is being put to good use. It's not every day we get to be part of history, but here at the Nez Perce Indian Reservation in the American Pacific Northwest, that's exactly what's happening. The Nez Perce have chosen to take the members of the Akulteki breed, which is a breed of horse from Turkmenistan, north of Iran. They breed them to the famous Appaloosas that have been so much a part of Nez Perce history. And the result is right here. This little guy, five days old, and the newest member of a horse breed called the Nez Perce. Dedicated horseman Rudy Shabala is the director of the breeding and young horsemanship program for the Nez Perce Registry, where all this began. In 1993, the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee they um, sat down and wrote these objectives out. Uh, gave me the instruction to implement a um, horsemanship program for Nez Perce youth to instruct in equitation, horsemanship, uh, the business of horses. And, and that was our first part of our program. We built these facilities. Uh, we built pastures. And, the next part uh, was that I was to establish a, uh, a horse breeding program. And so we're known historically for having uh, developed the Appaloosa, or the ancestor of the Appaloosa, the original Nez Perce horse. And this was documented um, in 1805 and 1806 by uh, the explorers Lewis and Clark, where they noted that Nez Perce horses were comparable to the finest of uh, Virginia coursers, you know, to quote them. The connection with the past through horsemanship, through language and through culture, it's always been there that the fire's been kept burning. We are now able in our generation in this modern time of ours uh, to be able to um, say that we have, um, uh, I guess, upheld and we're living the standards set by our, the, our ancestors, the old time Nez Perce horse breeders. The breeding program and the young horsemanship program are very much connected. This is not only developing a great future for the tribe as they introduce a new breed, but also teaching their children history while securing a future in the horse industry. As far as the goals originally, uh, our vision was to have Nez Perces all raising horses and be, be having a total horse culture like we used to. I was hoping to come a lot more comfortable with horses and to learn how to take care of them, hopefully own a horse myself. They started up with the knowledge of their ancestors, you know, ability and renown for horses. And it seems to me they have picked it right up and con are continuing on with it. So why did you want to get into this program in the first place? Because mm, I like horses and it's part of our culture. There is a time every day when the opportunity comes to um, let the children know in one aspect or another that 
you know, they are doing what their ancestors used to do. That's a good, strong part of it. The other part is this responsibility, you know, responsibility caring for an animal that you have confined, uh, whether it's in a pasture, a paddock, or a stall. Uh, it's the everyday responsibility that these children are, are learning, and uh, it gives them a sense of, you know, a purpose. You know, they get up and they've got something that depends on them, and it's important. I thought I knew a lot, but I didn't know quite a bit. I knew how to ride horses since I was a little kid. And that was basically it. I'm learning how to catch the horses and when they're acting out, put them in circles. They'll get out of it a lot better. Plus, they get excited and you just have to keep them control like a puppy. I just want my kids to know about horses, because it's like, it's part of our life, our, our past, I guess. Mm -hmm. so. and, and can you see it being part of your future as well? Yeah. yeah can. Like, what would you like to do when you get out of this program as far as with horses is concerned? Probably just get some of my own. <laughs> really? And yeah, that'd be nice. Raise them? Yeah. The overall goal and the objective is to, to, to bring it back into the tribe. And, and for me, personally, myself speaking, is that I want to see, you know, all these houses down the road, you know, I want to see a horse tied up in the backyard, you know. When we come back, we'll see some of the Nez Pierce horses and talk to Rudy about how successful the breeding program has been. Like a lot of people, I'd never heard of the Akulteki horses. They come from Turkmenistan in the former Soviet Union, but why were they chosen to create the new Nez Pierce strain of horses? The Akulteki, um, um, they're documented to run 120 miles a day up to 10 days in a row. They've been known to do that. They were bred um, to be war horses, and they say there's, they have no known ancestor. They um, evolved uh, strictly um, their, their means of survival was to be able to run from danger. They have been selectively bred since 1000 BC. They're used for racing. Even the, a lot of the Western Europeans, people were using these horses to improve their horses. It is said that the purebred Akulteki is one of the founding sires, uh, the, one of the founding breeds of the English thoroughbred. We've used the Akulteki. The other is their rarity. There are only uh, known to be 2,000 of these horses left alive in the world today. Right. And there are approximately 250 in North America. Hmm. I didn't know that. And by this combination, and perhaps maybe the most important reason, too, could be, is that in modern times, the Nez Perce people, by using the Akulteki and the modern Appaloosa can create again a unique strain of horse that comes strictly from the Nez Perce people. We have now, our oldest horses are three years old. We're just now starting to ride them. We started training them about a month ago, and then we're starting to ride them, and we're very pleased with their results. They're very trainable. They're very even-tempered. They're easy to train. You know, we kind of feel like we're experts in training of horses, working with these foals, these colts and mares. 
Um, we want to um, uh, explore their possibilities and when they're five years old we want to try some of these horses endurance um, uh, racing and um, after you know we want to start breeding them back to each other breed them back to Akaltekis and breed some to Appaloosas. We think uh, that'll be the second generation with that mating. And then the third generation will be able to set the type, we think. So we're looking at about another 10 to 15 years, you know, as far as setting the type. But we're excited. People that come to see our horses, they're seeing really nice horses. They're seeing exceptional horses. He's a true racing champion, and at 27 was the oldest living Kentucky Derby winner. This is Bold Forbes. Born in 1973, Bold Forbes is the grandson of the great Bold Ruler. As a yearling, the Dark Bay Stallion was sold to banker Esteban Tizzo from Puerto Rico for the tidy sum of $15,200. The young stallion wouldn't demonstrate his true abilities until his first official race. He was 35 to 1 in his very first race. That's the race he won by 17 lengths. Um, the reason for that being is when, when uh, Bold Forbes went into training, um, he really didn't like working out in the mornings. He really didn't show a whole lot of speed, but what they didn't realize that even though he didn't like working in the mornings, he had the heart of a champion and a competitor. Um, once he got out onto that racetrack and he was racing against other horses, he changed. Actually, believe it or not, um, all the stable hands and everyone in his barn did not bet a dime on this horse in his very first race. His winning streak continued in his next four races where he won them all by a combined 51 likes and was named champion two-year-old in Puerto Rico. In the summer of his two-year-old season, Bold Forbes was set off to New York. Bold Forbes would again take command of his competition. And they're off. On the outside, Bold Forbes quickly takes the lead by a length and a half. Poverty. Winning the Tremont Stakes and Bold the Saratoga Forbes Special before an injury would cause him to take the rest of his two-year-old season off to recoup. As a three-year-old, Bold Forbes was ready for an attempt at the Triple and Crown. The call of the dirt. At the post. And they're off. Bold Forbes breaks for the lead with Delacutionist alongside. On that May weekend in 1976, Bold Forbes took the lead right out of the gate and never gave it up. Forbes, the leader by a half, honest pleasure drawing alongside. Bold Forbes was known as a speed horse. He liked to break out of the gate in front and then just run as fast as he could for as far as he could. So not a lot of people really thought he would do well in the longer distances of the Triple Crown races because of that. And uh, so Honest Pleasure's jockey kind of let Bo go off on a real easy lead. Bo opened up on the field. He thought this horse is going to tire. I'll catch him in the stretch. Wrong. Coming with the wire is Bull Forbes, the leader with Honest Pleasure driving. It's Bull Forbes and Honest Pleasure. They're going to come to the wire together. He led wire to wire and became one of only 10 horses to do so in Derby history. Bull Forbes passes it, comes to the wire. After finishing Derby, Bull Forbes, he wins it one way. Honest Pleasure is second. That'll be the finish too. The Preakness would be a disappointment for the sturdy little 15-1 Bay and his fans. And they're standing good. It looks like Eddie Blind has them set, and they're off. A bold Forbes goes for the lead in the center of the racetrack, and it's Kojak down on the inside. He's going to show that speed today. Honest Pleasure third on the outside. Elecution. He actually ended up running the fastest first half mile in Preakness history. Uh, of course, Bo did his job, though. Uh, he ran Honest Pleasure into the ground. Um, but unfortunately, during that time, Bo did sustain an injury to his left hind heel. Uh, he actually lost over a quarter of his foot during that race. He managed to finish third, but Honest Pleasure finished even further back. Elocution is driving out the lead, moves up two and a half, then play the red a second and a half leg. Bull Forbes in third at the finish. Elocution is the surprising three and a half leg winner. Play the red is second. Bull Forbes third, further back. Kojak, then Honest Pleasure, and finally Life's Hope. They didn't even think he'd be able to run in the Belmont Stakes three weeks later. Um, they fitted him with a special shoe that was actually only a three-quarter shoe because he only had three-quarters of his foot left. 
Um, but he still managed to go out there and win the mile and a half race. And they're off. And on the outside, Majestic Light, there goes Bold Forbes on the far outside. Bold Forbes Once again, he took the lead, lead out of the gate. As best laid plans, Bold Forbes has the lead by four. Great contractor, second ahead on the outside, Mackenzie Bridge, past the 16th pole. Bold Forbes has the lead. Here comes Mackenzie Bridge, great contractor, third. Bold Forbes, Mackenzie Bridge on the outside. The amazing thing about the uh, the Belmont Stakes is he did manage to cross the finish line a neck in front, but just after he crossed the wire, this horse dropped to his knees in total exhaustion. Uh, he gave it everything he had, and he won the Belmont Stakes on heart alone. Bold Forbes was retired after his next race, but not before he was voted three-year-old of the year. Syndicated for $5.2 million, Bold Forbes sired 304 winners out of 430 foals. He sired 30 stakes winners, and his offspring have earned over $18 million. His career stats are impressive, with 18 starts and 13 wins, and he never did worse than placing third. Bold Forbes passed away on August 9th of 2000 after complications with gastroenteritis. He was 27 years old. Bold Forbes, an undisputed racing legend. Your Horse's Health, presented by Bear. For over 100 years providing health care products for you and your horse. Holly's looking for a weak spot on the horse's electrical field. A weak test will allow Holly to push Dagmar's elbow downward, pinpointing the spot that needs adjustment. Well, a boo-boo, we'll have to fix this one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply force that will cause the pelvis to shift forward and just hop a little, all right? And I'm going to do this the easiest way I know, which means I'm going to do it with my shoulder. I can do it with a, a mallet and a cane tip, but... And it's not a function. There, we get a nice square halt. All of a sudden, the legs are the same length. And that sounds so dumb. But if you, if you get the horse right heel... This is how an adult horse stands. Come on around, Dagmar. Let's see if we got it. Ugh, there's another yecky. Right here. This I'm going to use my mallet and my cane tip for. This is a really common displacement, too. Okay, look at that neck. I love that neck. Look at that. Now he's yawning. I says, yes, I can put a horse to sleep. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot about horses when I started, and there's just so much to know. And, and the horses come over and they say thank you. Complete Rider Letters. This week, Mary Samelko from Bozeman, Montana is asking Gail this question. My hands bounce up and down on the rising trot. How can I stop them from doing this? That's a very good question. Riders' hands going up and down at the rising trot is a very common problem amongst up and coming young riders. But fortunately, it's extremely easy to correct. A rider's hands bounce up and down at the rising trot when they have a locked, stiff elbow. Mario is a bouncy horse, making this even more difficult. Let's see how we can fix this. As Emily is going into her rising trot, her elbow should be open. As she sits back down, it should be closed. In order to help the rider through this, to get the feeling of the movement in the elbow, I'll have Emily hold on to the horse's mane at the rising trot so she can feel the movement through her elbow. Okay, Emily, let's go give it a try. So with the rider's hands on the horse's mane, they can feel the movement in the joint of the elbow. Open, close, open, close. Very good. So a quiet, balanced hand on a horse is crucial so that you don't bump your horse in the mouth on their bit. A relaxed elbow makes for a happy horse. For The Complete Rider, I'm Gail Greenough.